Welcome to this edition of the Western Wisconsin Journal. My name is Ken Holman. I'm chairman of the City of Hudson Urban Forestry Board. And today we're here to talk about the arrival of the emerald ash borer in Hudson. Uh, today we have uh, two other panelists, uh, Scott Hankey with the Save a Tree Tree Service Company and the new Parks and Public Works Director for the City of Hudson, Mike Mraz. And uh, Scott, if you would start by giving a little background and sure. on your... Uh, I've been a consulting arborist uh, for about 22 years now. Uh, graduated from University of Minnesota. I'm an arborist with St. Croix Save a Tree. Uh, we're a local company in Afton, service uh, all of Wisconsin and uh, Minnesota. Um, and just meet with uh, homeowners every day and kind of look at their trees, figure out how to keep them healthy and take care of them. Excellent. And um, m many in the audience will recognize the name Tom Zuli, who was the previous Parks and Public Works Director, and Mike is a replacement. Uh, so Mike, go into some detail about your background and uh, yeah. what you bring to the, the job. Yeah, so like Ken was saying, my name is Michael Mraz. I'm the new Director of Public Works and Parks. Uh, I come here from the city of New Richmond. I was the Operations Manager uh, for their Public Works Department for the past three years. Um, my background in urban forestry is um, attending a lot of classes, seminars. I was a recent graduate of the uh, Wisconsin DNR Urban Forestry uh, Community Tree Management Institute, uh, which was a uh, six-day course where we covered everything from writing ordinances, tree care, tree biology, uh, you name it. EAB was a hot topic, of course. So. Uh, I come here to the city of Hudson with a, with a, a lot of experience uh, working with trees and in that type, type of capacity, so. Very good. Yes, we're glad to have Mike on board, Michael on board. Yep. So uh, to begin with, um, uh, what is emerald ash borer and, and where did it come from? I'll, I'll uh, start off by saying that emerald ash borer is an exotic pest introduced into the United States in southeast Michigan originally in the uh, early 200s, about 2002. And uh, it was uh, thought to have been brought in packing material, which many pests are transported in, from Asia where this pest originates and has many enemies to hold it in check, populations in check. Those, enemy, those enemies, those predators of the emerald ash borer do not exist in this country unless they're introduced, and we can cover that a little bit later. So the, the uh, emerald ash borer has had pretty free reign on uh, decimating ash trees across the country now. It's spread pretty far. And um, it is uh, now building, the population is building in Hudson. So we're preparing and want to share what we're doing with the audience. Um, again, it comes from Asia. Uh, the beetle is a... Uh, uh, a uh, beetle that uh, lays eggs on the bark, and we, we'll have a short video that shows the life cycle. Uh, those eggs that uh, produce a worm that tunnels through the bark and feeds on the inside, under the wood inside, where uh, nutrients are conducted that are produced in the crown of the tree. So, as you'll see from the video, there is this cutoff of nutrients uh, that starves the tree, slowly kills it and uh, eventually does uh, completely kill the tree. It usually happens over a period of three, four, five years, and uh, very often is not detected until that third or fourth year after infestation. So it's a tricky character. It's a lot more difficult to detect than Dutch elm disease was. So what's the big deal about moving firewood? Sometimes we move things we don't want, like emerald ash borer. The beetle larvae hatch from eggs and chew through bark. They feed on the wood and cut off the tree's nutrients. They live under the bark in winter, and when they come out in the spring as winged beetles, they can fly off and eat other ash trees. Emerald ash borer might seem like a small bug, but it's a big deal to Minnesota. Don't spread emerald ash borer. Burn firewood where you buy it. So the status right now in, in uh, Hudson is that we were uh, notified by the state that the uh, Pest was confirmed in uh, Hudson near the intersection of Carmichael and Crestview in the commercial area. And um, this, I, we also found out that it was uh, also found in Hudson Township 
uh, just east of the Willow River State Park, and both of those locations, fines, make a lot of sense because the pest is usually transported by firewood, and we can see somebody stopping at a fa fast food place off of 94 that has firewood going to camp. So uh, we want to get, uh, want to inform you about what to look for and what you can do. So uh, let's uh, ask Scott if he can describe some of the symptoms of uh, EAB infested ash trees. Sure. So um, as Ken was saying, uh, ash trees, uh, you know, they're a tough tree. They, they're not always showing symptoms right off the bat of when the insect starts attacking the tree. So for the first, I would say two to three years, you might just see a real general thinning of the upper canopy. And it tends to be in the upper canopy. Um, the beetles and their larvae will start to kind of work at the top of the tree and work its way down, cutting off the nutrients and water supply as you go. So if you can imagine, slowly that upper canopy is being um, deprived of its nutrients and water, the leaves start to get a little bit smaller, a little bit thinner. In about year three and four, then we're going to start to see uh, you know, die back in the upper canopy. You'll definitely notice some woodpecker activity in the upper canopy. Um, for whatever reason, those woodpeckers are really able to find that larva in the upper canopy and they really hone in on that. And um, once you start to see that, you know, not all woodpeckers are bad and it's just because you have a woodpecker on your tree doesn't mean that your tree has emerald ash borer, but it's a good reason to start looking a little bit closer. Year four and five, you get real significant dieback um, to the point where, you know, the tree is probably about 50 to 60 percent, um, you know, dead. You then start to see, you know, your exit holes, your D-shaped exit holes that you, you know, hear about in literature, and you start to see a lot of sprouting in the uh, lower canopy. Um, you might see some cracking in the trunk. Uh, that's usually four or five years. And at that point, then it's pretty obvious that the tree has significant problems. Let's zero in on that bark cracking a little bit because I sure. think that's one of the telltale signs as well as this woodpecker flecking, as it's called. And right. we'll have some pictures for the. But the uh, the larvae, the worm stage of the insect, does uh, burrow back and forth and mm -hmm. creates a very characteristic S-shaped uh, larval gallery, yeah. if you will. How is that associated with the bark crack? So uh, what happens with the bark cracks, and you kind of have to understand how just the tree in general heals over um, or grows over a wound. Um, a tree will create something called callus wood. It's essentially wood that kind of around the injury rolls and tries to shut back together. And ash trees are just, you know, they're, like I said, they're such a tough tree that they're trying to fight off this insect. So where that larva was tunneling, the tree underneath the bark starts to roll this tissue doesn't quite seal it off, but tries to do it, and that kind of raises up the bark underneath. And then eventually, as things weather, that tissue rolls a little bit, you get some cracking, and you can actually see some of those galleries if you pull back the bark. Now, uh, before people start climbing their trees, uh, mm -hmm. these symptoms tend to happen higher in the crown to begin Correct. with. Correct, and, and that's where, and, and the funny thing is, one of our first indicators are if we start to see a little bit of woodpecker activity, um, you know, you 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 know, some of the trees are pretty tall. So, you know, that's what I do as a job. That's you know, I come am the first one to check out a tree for for my clients. Um, look at it, see first off, is it an ash tree? You know, are we starting to have some symptoms of maybe some ash borer in there? And uh, if the case, sometimes it warrants having a guy climb a tree check some samples, you know, and further, further checking from there. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And um, in fact, that uh, is a good transition to what we want to talk about in terms of what the city, what kind of advice the city is providing to homeowners. So um, first of all, the uh, Urban Forestry Board has been very active for the last eight, nine years in preparing for this pest to arrive. We knew it was going to arrive. And uh, we're not surprised that it's, that it's finally been discovered here. Uh, probably has been here for several years. So uh, in an effort to uh, collect and organize information that homeowners will need, uh, we've redesigned a web page on the city's website uh, titled Emerald Ash Borer in Hudson. 
And on that city page, and you'll see this on the, uh, on the screen, uh, there are uh, several publications that are uh, linked to the website. Uh, first of all, how to identify the tree. We want to help people understand how, how we identify ash trees. And I will say, and there's some other pictures of the branching habit, that uh, the ash is one of the few trees in uh, our area that has opposite oriented branches. In other words, they're in pairs opposite each other uh, along the larger branches. And the leaves are also paired that way. Uh, the other common uh, species of tree that uh, has this arrangement are, are maples. They're opposite oriented. But the maple tree has uh, simple uh, leaves. In other words, the, the leaf stem is attached directly to the uh, uh, branch. Uh, whereas in ash trees, they're compound or uh, have leaflets, so the, the leaf is actually a uh, um, set of leaflets that are usually from uh, seven to nine, I think, on the green ash. Uh, and, but the more distinguishing characteristic is really the bark on trees that are, um, you know, five or six, at least five or six inches in diameter, and it has this, a ridged diamond-shaped bark to it. So. It would be good in, in the first publication on, online uh, goes through details of, about identifying ash trees. And then uh, the next publication is a uh, guide for homeowners on deciding what they uh, might do with their tree. And I guess I would turn to Mike at this point and, and ask you to uh, describe a little bit about that decision that the homeowners have to uh, make. Absolutely. And I think what I'll do is I'll kind of I'll kind of touch base as far as what we're doing as a city, as far as how we're de determining whether or not to save one or two to take it down. Um, but before I do that, maybe it's now a good time to mention something about mountain ash. Ah, um, thanks. Just because I've gotten phone calls since I've been here about um, how about a mountain ash? Is that safe or is that being attacked by EAB? So I don't know if maybe you want to touch on that before I go into what we're doing on yeah the side. the mountain ash is just is an ash by name only it's not in the uh, ash uh, genera uh, genus but um, it has it's it's a smaller tree people will recognize it as having a colorful bark um, again a compound leaf smaller leaflets than the regular ash and has bunches of bright orange berries uh, that are produced each year mm -hmm. uh, smaller stature tree so that's not to be confused with green ash or white ash. Yeah, yeah. So I guess from, from the city's perspective and what, what we're kind of advising homeowners is, like you said, go on to the website. There's a lot of good information on there to determine, you know, as a homeowner what your options are. Um, the first thing would be, you know, to identify, identify that it is an ash tree. Um, you're going to want to look at the age of the tree. Is it, is it a youthful tree? Um, I know on the city's side of things, anything with a six inch DBH, which is diameter at breast height, um, we've been removing just because those trees are easily, um, you can replant a, a similar tree uh, to provide those same benefits. Um, trees that are under power lines or utility lines, you know, we've been removing those. So if you're a homeowner and you have an ash tree that's close to utility line, it might be beneficial for you to remove it at that time. Um, and then the third option, of course, is treating it. And you're going to want to get in touch with professionals like Scott uh, and, and see if, you know, your tree is going to be uh, one that you're going to want to treat because it is a, a long-term investment. Once you start treating an ash tree, it's not like you treat it once or twice and it's good for the rest of its life. It's going to be, you know, every three years, is two there's to a three. two to three yep. years, you're going to have to treat that tree. So, um, you know, those are some of the decisions that homeowners are going to have to make personally. And, and so, Scott, would you say a little bit more about the decision process about whether, how you determine whether your tree is worth saving? Sure, sure. So, um, what I do for my clients is I kind of walk them through, first, the identification of the tree, also identification of what other trees they have on their property. Do you have a sugar maple? Do you have an oak tree? Do you have a elm? Do you, you know, what do you have? And kind of talk about, okay, this tree will last this long, this tree will last this long kind of see what you like too. So, um, you know, knowing what other trees you have uh, really helps kind of drive that conversation. Um, 
you know, if you have some nice trees that maybe you want to have flourish a little bit more, um, maybe the ash tree is not something that you uh, want to protect or want to treat. Um, also, I go through, you know, obviously we need to look at safety. Um, where is the tree located? Um, how hard would it be to remove this tree should it get emerald ash borer? Um, you know, just a side note, emerald ash borer infested trees become very brittle and actually become very dangerous to remove. Um, so the cost goes up on that too. Um, and just safety in general for your house, uh, people in the yard, power lines, all that thing. So um, looking at where that tree is located, um, what's the worst case scenario if the tree does get uh, emerald ash borer. And then just really, really decide or help decide, is this a valuable tree? Is it gonna be here long term? Um, and uh, you know, kind of finalize your decision from there. And um, I, I think Save a Tree uh, will come out and do a, an assessment at no charge. Absolutely. To begin yeah. with. Yep. Um, and I, I guess I would like to, uh, and people will be thinking, well, what does this cost? Mm -hmm. uh, can you give us a general idea about the cost of treating a tree? Sure. What options are, and perhaps even cost of removal? Right. Um, well, the cost of the cost of the treatment, um, uh, we, we really tend towards the um, you know direct injections, um, which is a treatment that will last two years uh, usually, um, sometimes three if you don't have a real heavy infestation. But um, cost is based on the diameter of the tree because that kind of is what dictates how much product we use, um, and so. Uh, roughly, you know, a 10-inch diameter a tree might cost you know, $100, $150, and kind of upwards from there as far as the diameter goes. And we would measure that, and mm -hmm. um, you know, you should have an exact cost of what what that would cost. So roughly uh, eight to ten dollars per diameter. Inch. Correct. Correct. Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, and then removal. Cost? Well, as far as removal, that really is variable. Yep. Um, a tree that might be in your front yard, um, you know, similar size, uh, maybe a few hundred dollars. Um, a tree in your backyard, uh, it could be thousands of dollars. Really depends on what kind of equipment you have, what kind of access you have to that tree. Um, and then like I said before, if the tree is infested, then a, a whole different game. Um, sometimes we can't even climb the tree to safely remove that tree. So it really goes up from there. Let me, let me press you on that a little bit yeah. because people are uh, somewhat familiar with Dutch elm disease and, and very often we see uh, elm trees that have been dead for years, mm -hmm. decades, sure. standing as a bare skeleton. Yeah. Can you explain a little bit more why the ash does not follow that same? Right. Well, and, and I think it also, so the ash just tend to be a little bit more brittle and kind of, um, you know, well, to go back to the elm, Elm has a real stringy wood comp composition, and so mm -hmm. I mean, all you have to do is watch them in a storm. They are moving all over the place and try to split in a piece of elm wood. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can't. Yep. Whereas an ash tree is very, you know, more straight up and down grains, um, and also they really split away easily. That's fine. Keep in mind too what the emerald ash borer larva is doing. It is girdling that outer ring of wood. And that really adds a lot of strength to the tree. So if you have not just one, but multiple insects girdling the inside of that tree on the outside, that really is compromising the, the structure integrity of that tree. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned to me in, in our conversation mm -hmm. about uh, a certain percentage of the tree uh, being dead and sure. you won't even climb it. Sure. Um, w we've been finding, um, you know, through in you know, the last few years in experience, um, up to you know 50 percent dieback, 60 percent dieback, we won't even climb the tree. Um, a lot of times we'd have to use a crane for something like that. So 50 percent dieback, what that might look like is just the upper 50 percent of the tree dead, which really it sounds bad, but you, you're looking at a tree that's died back 50 percent, doesn't look like much, yeah. um, but that tree is already probably been infested for about four to five years. Right. Yeah. So that should play into some of the homeowner's response too. If you do have a tree in the backyard that isn't easily accessible by equipment and needs to be climbed to be taken down, right. you know, maybe you want to look at removing that tree sooner rather than later 
to save on costs or possibly of treating that tree. So, yeah. absolutely. And I mean, you, it, it's a real hard conversation yeah. to talk about maybe removing a tree that does look okay yeah. and looks good. Um, but at the same time, it's it, a lot of it comes down to a financial just, um, you know, we love trees. I mean, yeah. not even a question, but mm -hmm. you know, if it's going to cost you thousands of dollars or a liability later on, yeah, you know, and sometimes it's something you have to think about. So how, um, how much is that tree worth to you? Correct. And, and you mentioned that, uh, or Mike did, that the uh, treatment is is uh, effective to protect the tree for two to three years. Is right. that the general understanding? Two to three years, yeah. And I would say two years if you have real heavy infestation um, because, and even from what we've been finding, even with a treatment, the treated trees are showing some attack from the insect. You know, the treatment is not a barrier for the insect to not um, attack the tree. So the, the, the ash borer will still try to attack that infested tree. Um, maybe get 10% die back, um, but it's kind of weathering the storm. So um, if you have a real heavy infestation, generally you go about two years. Do you want to speak about other products on the market available for homeowners? Because I know there's a lot of kind of do-it-yourself type sure. kits and yep. the effectiveness of those. Any luck, any success is seen, or you know maybe just touch on that. Sure. Um, the so we have our direct injections. That's kind of the one main delivery system. The other main that's system the, that's the best is uh, it, it yeah. tends to be yeah. more it stands up to the pressure a little bit better. Mm -hmm. um, there's also uh, systemic insecticides which um, you know, more for you do it yourself is you would look at you know, your smaller trees, kind of 15 inch diameter and smaller, um, and can provide some protection. Um, if you have a heavy infestation, you, it, it doesn't stand up as well, but if, it, if it's a real, you know, kind of like starting in your area, you definitely could do that. Um, generally speaking, you apply that to the soil. Um, one of the, uh, um, Common products use the active ingredient is uh, imidacloprid. You can find those at um, mm -hmm. you know Home Depots or Lowe's or you know hardware stores like that. Definitely have to follow the directions and how to how to apply it. That's all right on the label. Um, those products usually last for about a year. So the the option that we bring up about the, for homeowners to treat the, their tree mm -hmm. more of a soil drench right. uh, and doesn't involve the uh, more uh, detailed technology of uh, systemic injection of actually putting plugs in there and pu administering the chemical uh, system Correct. Like under pressure. Correct. And you actually, the, the, the products that you use in the direct injections, you need a commercial pesticide applicator's license, whereas the, um, a lot of systemics you buy over the shelf, you don't. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of um, treatments, and this is one of the topics that we kind of wanted to to speak to the viewers about and kind of drive home is um, just because your ash tree doesn't show signs of any infestation at this point in time, mm -hmm. because the the emerald ash borer has been found in the city of Hudson, um, we are highly recommending that if you want to save your tree, now is the time to start treating it. Because like Scott was saying, just because you know your tree hasn't shown signs, you know it still might be in that tree or in your neighborhood and it just takes that three to four year cycle. So um, the, the general kind of industry standard is once, once uh, the, the beetle has been found within a 15 mile radius of a certain area, you're gonna wanna start treating those trees in order to save them. So that's kind of one thing to consider as well as a homeowner. I know the city of Hudson has started their treatment program back in 2015 or 16. Right. Um, and we've been trying to um, you know treat uh, 30 to 30 40, to 40, yeah, 30 year, to 40 yeah. trees per year. So um, that's a very important point. Um, if you want to save your ash tree, now is the time to start. Don't wait two, three years, because um, by that time it might be too late to save it. So again, I would uh, refer the audience to the website where there are uh, some very uh, good detailed uh, fact sheets from the University of Wisconsin Extension and the Department of Natural Resources about uh, how to decide whether your tree is worth it uh, what tree removal, uh, what tree treatments are available, and more details about uh, the chemical action, the protective action that those compounds take. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a good transition. Mike started to mention the, uh, some of the uh, 
approach that the city's taking and really the decision that homeowners have to take uh, make about their trees are the same decisions that the city has been making for a good six, eight years now mm -hmm. about uh, ash trees that are in the public inventory. Uh, those that are were in conflict with utilities or structurally defective uh, were being, uh, have been removed, uh, but we still have a, a pretty healthy population of, of ash trees and uh, we'll be looking more closely at opportunities to treat good trees in good shape and uh, be removing uh, proactively trees that. Yeah, yeah. Um, like Ken was saying, uh, at the start of this, this you know, EAB process, the Urban Forestry Board and, and Tom has been very proactive on trying to combat this, this, this pest. Um, and uh, it's because of them that we're in, in fairly, good con fairly good shape within the city of Hudson and in, in, in our ash tree population. Um, at the start, when we had the initial inventory done, we had about 1,400 uh, public ash trees throughout the city of Hudson. It made up approximately a quarter of our tree species, maybe a little more. So typically, um, the recommendations to have no more than, was it 8% or 6% or of one species taking up your inventory. So we were a little behind the, the eight ball on that one. But, you know, we started at 1,400 and we've removed approximately 300 ash trees up to date. So we're down to that 1,100 mark between 1,000 and 1,100. Um, and of the remaining ones, we're either treating them or, um, you know, we're looking at possible for future removals. Um, the problem is, is we're getting into those those size categories where the the city crews are having difficulties just because of our equipment. We don't have the right equipment, uh, so we're having to make decisions on be more selective on which ones we do remove. So and which ones are contracted out? And which ones are contracted out? And that's one thing moving forward, where you know, as a city, we'll be looking to budget, you know, for future removals and maybe increasing that line item so that we can, you know, start to take some of those ones that are, you know, that we aren't able to do in house. That's great information. So let's talk about another basic strategy here. And uh, we thought, uh, I've been in this business for 40 years, just recently retired. And uh, if there's one thing I thought we learned from Dutch elm disease is not to plant the same type of tree <laughs> up and down the street. But in fact, that's uh, what happened with the green ash in uh, many cities and through the 70s and 80s. Uh, when the elms came down, green ash went in and very often it was an easy, tree species to propagate in the nurseries, very tough for urban settings. Mm -hmm. So it was very popular for both cities to plant and homeowners. But we find ourselves in the same situation we were in with Dutch elm disease. Fortunately now we have disease resistant elms. In fact, the city has just started planting a, a St. Croix disease resistant elm, which is the parent tree is right across the river in Afton. And, um, but we're also focused on planting a variety of trees on public property and encouraging homeowners to do the same. So uh, Mike, uh, and I'll help you out here, but can you talk a little bit about the gravel bed system that the uh, city has employed? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a really a neat uh, way to purchase uh, tree stock at a discounted rate because the gravel bed is, is, a, is a pit of rocks um, and you're able to purchase bare root trees and you put the uh, tree into the rock and then you irrigate it. And I believe we have some photos uh, to attach yes. to so you have an idea. And you, you put them in the gravel bed in the spring, you irrigate them all summer long and then in the fall, you're able to remove those trees mainly by hand, pull them out and their root system is very fibrous, uh, very healthy and then we're able to plant in the fall. Um, you know, it's, it's, like I said, it's, it's low cost, you know, instead of purchasing a B and B for $250, you can buy bare root stock for $40, $30, depending upon the species. Um, the staff is able to move them without use of heavy equipment, loaders, skidders, you know, that type of thing. Um, and then, you know, it, you're able to involve the community on tree plants and do different species and, and really diversify your tree population. So it's been very successful here in the city of Hudson. I've been a part of different gravel beds in other communities and it's, uh, it's a great way to uh, reintroduce young stock into the urban forest and, and develop it and get away, try to diversify like you were saying. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I wanna em emphasize that point about engaging the community because uh, the Urban Forestry Board is very interested in employing uh, the citizen volunteers in planting and maintaining the trees that we're planting on public uh, rights of way in, in parks. 
Uh, another uh, effort that we have been uh, undertaking lately is uh, what's called tree treks. And I'll just uh, begin by describing the tree treks as a self-guided tour uh, of uh, trees to learn the, how to identify those trees uh, in, of different varieties. We have tree treks. The original one was uh, at the uh, River Crest School Arboretum, which is on the perimeter of that school uh, property on County Road F. Our uh, next one was in a Lakefront Park along the river. And uh, there are about 20 different individuals there uh, representing uh, 16 or 18 different species. And uh, we just uh, completed or are in the process of completing a uh, tree trek in conjunction and cooperation with the fifth grade students from St. Pat's, uh, Trinity Academy, and Willow River School. And if you're familiar with that uh, area in the historic district. And the kids have uh, gotten, done the research written up uh, descriptions of those trees, different tree species, and we created posts that uh, we have pictures of uh, to uh, help people identify, uh, learn to identify different types of tree and, ho and hopefully encourage them to plant, try a different tree, maybe instead of a maple. I think we have, when uh, Mike mentions the inventory and at uh, public trees at about 25% ash, it's another 25% maple in the public trees, but we are quite confident that the uh, breakdown on private property is more like 30% ash and 40% or more maple. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a good time to start mixing things up and in doing so, making a more resilient uh, urban forest for all of us to enjoy. Yeah. So one more thing about the tree trek, you know, by getting the, the youth involved, it is encouraging them to become more um, in tune to trees because trees are very beneficial to the city, um, to the urban forest. You know, they help reduce heating costs, cooling costs. Um, they absorb stormwater runoff, um, provide shade for outdoor activities. So it's, it's a part of the city's infrastructure that often gets overlooked sometimes. Um, but it's very valuable. It increases property values. Um, people are more apt to purchase homes with mature trees in front of them than, than a bare yard. So it's a, it's a resource within the city that, like I said, often doesn't get thought of, but is in need of, of you know, molding or just support. And by, encur by encouraging the students and young people within the community to, to help, maybe they'll encourage their, their family to purchase trees and just to, to encourage a new generation of people that, that like having trees. So, I see, yeah. we, we see that in the students in these great schools that are working on the track. Yeah. And it is a good uh, opportunity to teach their parents yep. about a tree variety. Uh, so uh, with that, um, I would just ask uh, finally if either of you have anything else to add to our uh, show here. Yeah. I guess one thing that I'll touch on that we discussed before the show was, you know, ash tree removals. You know, typically, um, you know, because the, the the beetle likes to tend to move around during the summer months. Um, if you do want to trim your ash tree or try to schedule to remove it, you know, best practice is to try and get that done before May or after Labor Day. And I know Scott has, you know, there's only so much time that, that he has to remove those trees, mm -hmm. but it will help kind of slow down the spread of that. Um, so that's just one thing to consider uh, from the city's perspective is, is try to help us kind of mm -hmm. slow down the spread now that it is here within the within the city of Hudson. So that was just one thing that I wanted to touch on. Very important reminder that uh, as we mentioned early in the show, it's the movement of wood, uh, be it pallet wood or firewood, that usually transports these pests long distances. Yeah. Scott, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, I, I think the, the main thing that I'd um, put across is just know what your trees are. Um, Ash trees are really an unassuming type of tree, um, and we all know what a big, beautiful elm tree looks like. We all know what oak trees look like. Ash trees, just, they're just kind of off in the corner. You know, you don't always know that you have an ash tree. Um, so it's just good whether you, you know, call a, a private company or, you know, ask, ask your city for help or, you know, anybody. Just, you know, kind of invest in your yard, invest in your trees, kind of know what you have. Maybe you have an ash tree, maybe you don't. Um, just become familiar with what, what trees are in your yard. Mm -hmm. Good advice. 
so in wrapping up, uh, we'd like to uh, remind you that all of this information we talked about is uh, available in detail on the city's webpage. Uh, if you search for EAB in Hudson, Wisconsin, um, you'll f go right to that page, uh, as well as the uh, tree treks in Hudson will get you to that uh, more detailed information about those trails. Uh, we also will uh, be organizing with the County Extension a uh, public forum. We've had a couple of them over the past uh, several years about Emerald Ash Borer. So look for information in the newspaper and on, online for that uh, event, which will likely happen later in this winter. So with that, um, for this edition of the Western Wisconsin Journal, I'm Ken Holman with the City of Hudson. Uh, thanking you for your time.